Hello, hello, hello! Andrew here. Since this previous weekend was my son's 10th birthday, yes, the dreaded double digit, I wasn't able to spend as much time making the video about Starlink and streaming as I'd originally planned. So because of that, I figured let's go instead and talk about some of the FAQs or frequently asked questions I've been getting about Starlink, and I'll save the streaming information for this upcoming Friday. So first of all, if you want to see Starlink's own FAQ, they do actually have something here if you go to www.starlink.com. And you can find it up here in the top right hand corner where it says FAQ. And they give you a list of questions that's commonly asked, for, asked of them as to whether or not things can be answered. This list though isn't really all inclusive and it just kind of scratches the surface. So most of the questions I'm going to be talking about are actually not found on this. And I think that it'd be better to get somebody's opinion than it would be to go ahead and to actually just go read an article. But I will link this down in the show notes so that way if you have your own questions and you want to see what they say, you can feel free to go ahead and take a look. So moving right on into it, one of the first questions I've been asked was actually a comment on the video which asked, could we do another Fortnite test where we actually listed out and had the latency set up so it was showing during the video. I'm actually going to go ahead and start playing that now. As you can see, we consistently get pings of less than 150. The kicker is it's not all the way down to that 20 level yet like Elon Musk talks about. I think this has to do with the fact that we still have that obstruction in my yard, plus the system is only in beta. So I think that this is an eventuality we'll get down to 20 millisecond pings rather than a starting point of 20 millisecond pings. Regardless, I'm really happy with how this is turning out for gaming because this does meet our needs in our household. We are, you know, fun gamers. We like to be competitive, but we're not really like top tier, you know, console gamers where we're going to be tournament players or anything like that. So the second question I get asked is, is Starlink something you can put on an RV? And is it something you can take with you anywhere? Like, can you travel with Starlink? And this one is kind of an interesting question because Now You Know actually did a really good video already about traveling around with Dishy McFlatface and trying it out 20, 30, 40 miles from home. And they were able to get their internet all the way, you know, for the farthest drive they made, which was across the state line. And I want to say it was like 40, 50 miles away from them. They were able to still get Dishy McFlatface to connect up and still get internet. The caveat to this, though, is, is even though that first test looks like it's okay, it's still not hundreds of miles like you'd be traveling in an RV. And if you specifically go to Starlink's website and check out their FAQ, and it talks about traveling, they say that your service area is actually defined by geometry, not necessarily by geofencing. And that that geometry is listed by how the satellites travel around the world. So remember, there's 600 satellites right now, or 1,600 satellites right now which means that if they're gonna add on another 42,000 and this hardware is going to continue to improve, eventually maybe you could. Right now though, they're telling us that no, you can't do it and you actually have to contact them back in order to change addresses because you're located within a cell when you buy that service, right? So my house, my service, my Dishy McFlatface is located in a cell and if I move too far away, my Dishy McFlatface would not work. Now I assure you that the people at SpaceX are probably already working on this because I mean they were smart enough to go ahead and make a reusable rocket. They're smart enough to go ahead and figure out how we're going to solve this problem, especially when their intention is to take from 1600 satellites currently right now to 42,000 satellites in the future. And they're actually talking about having, you know, if we were ever going to have a moon base using Starlink to communicate back and forth from the moon base back here to Earth. I have to imagine that's a problem that they're working on and they're thinking about. I just don't know that right now I would count on using it, putting it on top of an RV, and even trying to get any use out of it. So the third question I tend to get asked is, does it get impacted by weather? Well, we haven't had a hurricane here, we haven't had a, a tornado here, and we haven't had you know, a blizzard here since we've gotten Starlink. What I can tell you is, aside from that, we've seen all the different types of weather, including hail and sleet, and we have yet to have any problems with weather impacting our service. The only thing that's impacted our service is if power goes out. Because remember, 
Does she make flat faces physically powered? Right? So if power goes out, you don't have anything powering it to try to get the signal back and forth from the satellite. Other than that, though, we've been largely unaffected. So you may have a more extreme climate than I get with lake effect snow here over in northwest Ohio. But I'm going to guess that since Starlink actually goes ahead, the Shimmick Flatface will warm himself up and make certain that the snow and ice does not build up on top of him. I'm going to guess you're probably going to be okay. So the next series of questions that I get, I'm going to lump together. And that is, will it work out in the mountains? Will it work out in the rural areas? And will it work out in the city? And there's basically one way to tell whether or not it'll work. And that is, up in the sky, can you get an unobstructed view over the area that your application is telling you you'd be looking at with Dishy McFlatface? Basically, if you follow the, uh, what is it, the latitude requirements where you're down far enough that they're actually covering you in the beta, the reality is, as long as you have a clear, unobstructed view of the sky, nothing interrupts. Now, I only have a slight obstruction because of that one tree that I need to take up to the second story roof. But if it wasn't for that tree, I'd have no interruption and my latency would be better. The reality is, if you're in the mountains, all you need is a clearing to put it up on a large pole so that way you're not, unobst you're not obstructed by trees. If you're in the city, you probably don't have trees to deal with. You just need to make sure you're on the highest top rooftop of the building and you ain't got other buildings next to you that are taller that are obstructing your path of what you're looking at. As long as you can get a clear shot of the sky, you're probably okay. And I know that they're not pitching Starlink for being a city use program, but I'm going to tell you that not everywhere in Toledo has, you know, good high speed internet, even though it's still the city of Toledo. And I live in suburbia and I got better internet now than my neighbors have. So don't be afraid of thinking that, you know, you could go to Starlink internet just because, you know, you're, you're in, not in the rural country or you're not out in Timbuktu, the mountains. Don't be afraid to put your name in there. Because if you've got a clear shot of the sky, you know, you might as well go ahead and take advantage of it. The next question happens to be, how does this work with Zoom video conferencing? And I have to say overall, it's not too bad. But the real answer comes back to my tests I was doing last week when we were doing online gaming. If you go back to my tests, you'll notice that I was only getting four megabytes of upload from my computer, and I was only getting 13 megabytes of upload from the router. This means that if I'm actually hosting the meeting, not being on the listening end of the meeting, but I'm hosting and I'm trying to present my screen, this means that I'm really going to tax the system with only a four megabyte upload speed. It's probably not usable from that aspect. It's good enough to go ahead and listen on an interview, like do a Zoom conference call. It's probably good enough to go ahead and respond. I mean, I, my son does video conferencing with his friend all the time because he doesn't have a cell phone right? And we talk via FaceTime amongst our family through my laptop all the time, right? So it's good enough for that, but it's probably not good enough to go ahead and to present and try to play a video that's going to have to throw, you know, 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes back up at the Starlink satellite because you just don't have that kind of bandwidth. That's just the way it goes. Now that's not to say it won't come out where it'd be good enough to do it in the future. Just remember, they have 1,600 satellites up right now, and they have plans for another 42,000. So right now we're in beta, and we're getting what we're getting is already awesome. Just imagine how much farther it's going to be in the future. So the next question is, can you really cut the cord with Starlink? And the short answer is, yes, you can. Yes, I have. And no, I would not go back. I would not go back to the regular corded situation. The long answer to this is I'm actually in process of making a video where I compare and let you know how I've cut the cord completely, like what services I'm using, what I'm paying for those services, and why we decided to make the, ch the jump 100% over to where we're not using traditional cable services. Um, I'm going to cover that all in this next video. That's the one that I didn't get a chance to finish because of my son's birthday. Um, just to suffice to say, I'm pretty happy and I wouldn't go back. For more detail, go ahead and uh, if I'm good enough in the future, I'll, I'll link it up here in the card. Otherwise, look for the video that was released uh, the Friday after this one, and you'll find out all the scoop on what services we use and how we actually stream. And the last big question that I get asked is, why are you so excited about Starlink if it's not like a T1 line connection? And what's coming down in the pipeline in the future 
that makes you so excited. Now this one's gonna take a whole nother video as well, um, but I'm gonna give you kind of a hint. I can cut the cord completely with Starlink right now, and I have done so. So I'm old enough to know what life was like when we had dial-up internet and when we had internet that was, or when we had phone lines that were connected with a rotary dial, right? Suffice to say, this is a big a jump in technology that I don't think enough people realize that um, everybody seems to want to talk about how Apple and Tesla are going to compete against each other. I really don't think it's going to be Apple encringing on Tesla's turf. I think in the future what you're going to see is a, a Tesla smartphone linked up with a satellite internet service that's going to overtake an Apple phone linked up with a cell tower service. I just want you to think about what 2025 to 2040 could look like. We could be talking about a world where instead of Apple coming out with the Apple car and challenging Tesla, we could be talking about a world where your, your, sat, your, your solar, your power generation, your energy arbitrage, your transportation, um, it's all covered, even possibly your home heating and air conditioning, if they get involved in the HVACs, could be all controlled via Tesla and Tesla already in their cars provides internet service for $9.99 a month. They already have a software platform. Imagine when they start getting into an iOS themselves and start actually providing an operating system themselves. Are you going to want to go ahead and stick with a cell phone service that's only going to have be able to cover 25% of the world or are you going to want to stick with a satellite service which is going to be able to cover 100% of the world regardless of where you're at, um, and possibly even be usable interplanetarily, right? Like, I know I say that kind of laughing, but, you know, you don't know what's going on in the future. I can imagine being on one of these, uh, you know, SpaceX flights here later on, 20, 30 years from now, taking a, a trip around the Earth and actually having service, sat phone service, from the inside of my cockpit. I really think this is a bigger deal than people think. And the reason why I say that um, that it wouldn't be Starlink as opposed to being Tesla, that would be, because they are two distinct different companies, but the engineers in both companies work really well together, right? That's number one. And number two, you know, think of like Starlink is becoming the new Verizon, all right? Taking out the Buckeye broadband. Um, I really think that's going to be the cash cow that's going to feed SpaceX, and when you have that, everything else is going to be provided by Tesla. If you're going to provide everything else in Tesla, it just makes sense to vertically integrate. And I think there's a cost-benefit analysis to be made that you could probably add a couple trillion dollars of Tesla's worth without ever touching any single point of Apple's market share. But the reality is, if you have a choice between a sat phone and a cell phone, you're going to choose a sat phone every single time once the network's built good enough. So I'm going to make a whole video on that later. Um, that's really high level because this service has made me so excited about what's coming down the future for Tesla that um, I, I'm, my old instructor for Dale Carnegie used to say, you get so excited about something that you want to talk so much that your teeth itch. Well, I'm telling you right now, I can see the future. <laughs> I can totally see the future. And we should be excited about what's coming down the pipeline not just between now and 2030, but I'm talking between 2030 and 2040. It's amazing. And for the bonus question, because I have a lot of friends asking me now after I posted the last video, am I going to get back involved with WoW? Probably not. I'm going to putz around with it for the rest of the month, see if I can't get the old apps and add-ons I liked on the Mac and you know play it for a little while. The reality is, though, is um, I don't play a ton of video games, and... Not that I'm against them, it's just that I still have two kids that are of prime age to get driven around everywhere. So it's kind of hard unless I'm going to spend my nights, you know, from 10, 11, 12 o'clock and on playing in these raids or, you know, going ahead and questing then. It's kind of hard to devote any other time because all the other times that I have, you know, the family's awake. Um, and if the family's awake, I want to spend time with my kids and I want to spend time with my wife. Now, there's not to say there's anything wrong with gaming. And those who game together stay together. I, I completely agree with that. 
it's just a matter of I, I I don't see myself doing it very often. Put it that way. Maybe I'll keep the account. Maybe I'll do something a couple times a month. More than likely, um, it's even if I keep the account, it's going to be something that I'm not going to do very often. Well, that about wraps up today's episode. What I want to know, though, is how you feel about Starlink and the FAQs I presented. Tell me about it down in the comments below. And if you haven't done so already, hit that thumbs up button, click that subscribe button, and make certain you turn on notifications because you want to be notified when we release new videos. Remember, it helps out the channel. Here on the Dad Manual, we produce videos twice every single week. And remember, if you liked this video, I just did another video talking about online gaming with Starlink, and you can actually see the full review here. Until next time, I'm Andrew Sherman. This is the Dad Manual, and remember, failure isn't bad. Failure to try and learn is. Have a good one.